Well, everyone, I'm just uh, really broken with um, Yeah. Okay. So we're ready for the final talk of the workshop. As you may have noticed, heute ist Deutsche Freitag. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Professor Heinrich Glansing for the last talk of the workshop. Um, he needs no longer introduction than that. We love to have him here. And he's going to talk about connected uh, logic in a constructive fashion. So this is going to be really interesting. And uh, I'm uh, really pleased to welcome you back to Mexico, Professor. So, Karen, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Fernando, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you to Luis and to Fernando for organizing this uh, highly uh, inspiring, very much enjoyable workshop. Um, I'm not sure whether I can keep everybody awake after three hours of uh, talks and uh, discussions, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, I have a lot of time, so uh, I will um, go through the slides very slowly and uh, I will mostly read the slides. I hope you're, this is okay with you, for you. So the title is Constructive Logic is Connexive and Contradictory. Uh, if this sounds a bit provocative, yes, it was meant to be a bit provocative, but uh, the, the actual claim I make is not so, not so bold as you will see. Um, so here's the structure of the, press, of the talk. Uh, I will begin with some introductory remarks that uh, give you uh, roughly the dialectics of what I want to convey. And then uh, uh, I cannot avoid to, to present some preliminaries. I will uh, uh, present or recall, remind you of uh, four first order logics, namely uh, uh, first order intersynistic logic. Um, Q stands for quantified, so quantified intersynistic logic, quantified classical logic, first order N4. This is the first order version of Nelson's constructive power consistent four valued uh, logic with strong negation and also uh, quantified uh, the quantified connexive logic C, which is a variant of, of Nelson's logic. And then uh, after these preliminaries, I uh, want to um, present um, certain rather remarkable uh, schematic formulas. Uh, some of them have names in the literature. The, the, so there's the drinker principle. Uh, it was introduced into the literature by Raymond Smullyan in the 1970s. And there's a, a duel to it. And I uh, will discuss two other principles which um, have not yet uh, received names in the literature, the drinker truism and its duel. And after that, I come to the main part. I will come to the main part of the talk. I will um, compare uh, first order intersynistic logic, first order Nelson logic, and first order C with respect to their constructiveness or constructivity. And uh, then I will uh, summarize uh, what I said before. So this is the plan. And here's the introduction. So uh, the already mentioned drinker principle and its dual, they are really um, peculiar sentences. Uh, they are valid in classical first order logic, but they're invalid in uh, both intersynistic first order logic and uh, the first order extension of Nelson's four valued logic. So this is uh, already a, a dividing line between classical logic and, and these, these constructive systems, intersynistic logic and, and Nelson's N4. Uh, and uh, the Drinker principle and this dual are also invalid in uh, first order C the connexive variant or version of, uh, of N4. This is all fine, uh, but unlike, uh, unlike the drinker principle in its dual, there are two other principles uh, that are um, not at all unwanted. On the contrary, they are reproachless and I would say even appealing. And here we have a, a, a dual problem, so to speak, namely uh, uh, classical logic, intersynistic logic, and N4 all fail to validate these, these wanted principles. And guess what's going to happen? Um, the wanted drinker truism and the dual are not only valid in, quanti uh, in quantified C, so this is a, 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 a property where that, that, sets, uh, that distinguishes quantified C, but they can also be justified from the point of view of a a version of the brauer heitin kolmogorov interpretation of the logical operations and a version uh, which I take to be an improvement on the original BHK 
interpretation. And uh, it's a variant of an interpretation suggested by Edgar Lopez Escobar, and therefore I, uh, I call it the connexive Lopez, Lopez Escobar interpretation. And then I would I suggest to read these observations as showing that there is a sense in which the connexive logic C is more constructive than intersonistic logic and N4. Actually, the story is classical logic is clearly not constructive. Uh, intersonistic logic is often identified with, with constructive logic, while Nelson's four valued logic is in a clear sense even more constructive than intersonistic logic. And then, yes, we can add a bit, a tiny bit more of constructivity if we move from N4 to quantified C. So that's the plan of the talk. And since the connectivity of the constructive logic C that uh, enables the validation of the wanted drinker truism and its dual, um, I uh, here want to suggest that constructive logic is connexive and hence contraclassical. Okay. Um, now this step from, from uh, first order intersonistic logic to first order Nelson logic, it, uh, it, it secures uh, certain constructive, constructiveness features namely the constructible falsity property and the dual of existence property, which are, uh, which are in, in, uh, rather obviously indicators of constructiveness. And then the step from N4 to C delivers the drinker truism and the dual as valid. Um, so in addition to providing further motivation for the study of connexive logics, um, because this validation of the drinker truism and its uh, dual is a rather nice, nice thing, I would say, um, the greater constructivity of the non-trivial negation inconsistent logic QC in comparison to the constructiveness of intuitionistic logic and Nelson's four valid logic also suggests that constructive logic is not only connexive, but also contradictory. As you will see, uh, the, the logic C and its uh, first order extension uh, uh, is an example of a non-trivial negation inconsistent logic. Now I come to the preliminaries. Um, so, um, some, if not many of you, uh, will, will, will know these logics, but uh, I will nevertheless slowly go through, uh, go through uh, a presentation of them. And I will look only at um, axiom systems, because for my present purpose, it suffices to, to highlight the difference between these four logics in terms of their uh, axiomatic presentations. So uh, we use a simple first order language without function symbols and the identity predicate, because this is not needed for 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 uh, for the purposes of my of my talk. Uh, the set of terms contains uh, denumerably many individual variables, and then for every individual C from a given non-empty uh, domain of individuals, the language also contains uh, an, an individual constant C. We use uh, letters X, Y, Z for arbitrary variables, uh, lowercase letters A, B, C for arbitrary constants and the letter uh, um, lowercase t for an arbitrary term. And our logical vocabulary comprises uh, one place connective, the, uh, the tilde, negation, and uh, conjunction, disjunction, uh, the conditional implication, the universal quantifier, and the particular quantifier. And we have uh, n place predicate symbols and, uh, and brackets to make uh, the formulas uh, unambiguous. Good, so this is the language. And uh, we define the set of all L formulas as usual, and uh, as usually, and uh, we define also biconditional as, as uh, one would expect. Um, at some point, I will talk about literals. A literal is an atomic formula or a negated atomic formula. Uh, and also, we uh, use the standard notion of a free variable, a bound variable, a term being free for replacement with a ver variable in the formula. Uh, yes. I use this uh, notation for uh, uh, substitution. So A with T for X denotes the result of replacing all free occurrences of X in A by T. Uh, I will also uh, at some point look at uh, a fragment of the language. So the language L plus, it is obtained from L by just omitting the negation symbol. So this is the language of positive into synistic first order, first order logic. So I used the same the same uh, language for all the four predicate logics I will want to consider, and uh, we first look at uh, first order into synistic logic. So uh, H Q N so H stands for Heiting. So this is an axiom uh, for for Hilbert, of course, uh, uh, is an axiom system for first order into synistic logic. It's fairly standard, 
Uh, so uh, the first uh, eight, uh, wait a moment. Yes, the first eight axioms give you uh, an axiomatization for positive intuitionistic propositional logic. Then uh, we have uh, these uh, axioms eight, uh, eight, axiom eight and nine that involve uh, no axioms nine and ten. Sorry, that involve the the negation. So here's a kind of negation introduction axiom, and here kind of exfalso axiom. We have the standard axioms for the existential and universal quantifier, modus ponens, and these two familiar uh, rules uh, for, for the quantifiers. Okay, and um, yes, if we leave out the axioms that display the negation, we obtain an axiomatization of first order positive intuitionistic logic in the language L plus. Good. So this is first order intuitionistic logic presented axiomatically. And uh, we obtain uh, an axiomatization of classical first order logic by, by adding, for instance, uh, the double negation elimination schema. This is one, one option, one way to go. Now, if we uh, look at first order uh, Nelson's logic, uh, how can we present it? Well, we take all the, all the axioms for uh, first order positive intuitionistic logic. These were axioms A1 to A8. Uh, we take all the, the rules we had in positive, uh, in, in other rules we had in intuitionistic first order logic, and uh, we replace the two right. negation axioms by uh, by these ones. So, and these are uh, um, axioms that state um, uh, the falsity conditions of compound formulas. You can read the axioms in this way. So. Uh, we understand a negated negation, uh, not not A as A. A is equivalent with not not A. We understand a negated conjunction uh, so that we, and a negated disjunction so that we get all the De Morgan laws. So A and not B is false if and only if not A, uh, if A is false or B is false, A or not, uh, A or B is false if A and B are both false. And the, the, the axioms for the quantifiers, they, they give you the, the familiar duality between the, uh, uh, universal and particular quantifier. And what is highlighted here is a particular understanding of negated conditionals. Uh, not A implies B means A and not B. Good. So, uh, as you will know, we do not have all the De Morgan laws in first, in intuitionistic logic, but here uh, we have all the De Morgan laws. And nevertheless, the, the claim will be, yes, this is a constructive, uh, constructive logic. It's even more constructive than intuitionistic logic, although we have both uh, um, we, we have both double negation laws and we have all the demand laws. And then um, the step from there to, um, an, uh, to an axiomatization of first order C is very simple. So the, the two logics disagree about their understanding of negated conditionals. So instead of this axiom, not A implies B is equivalent with A and not B, we have not A implies B is equivalent with A, uh, with, with A implies not B. So, and I think these, these different axiomatizations give you already a good understanding of uh, what the differences are between classical uh, uh, intuitionistic uh, Nelson and uh, uh, first order logic and, and this first order C. Good. We are not yet done with all the preliminaries. Uh, this is a bit tedious. So we uh, uh, use a standard notion of, uh, of derivability. We say that Formula A is uh, derivable from a set of formulas. Uh, if there's a sequence of formulas, A1 to N A, uh, such that every formula in the sequence either belongs to the assumption set, delta is an axiom or, or is obtained from formulas proceeding in the sequence by means of the rules R1 to R3. So this is standard definition of derivability in this axiomatic context. Um, okay. Now I should, Although we just look at the axiom systems, nevertheless emphasize that these logics all have a Kripke semantics and a Gensen style proof, a Gensen style proof theory. Uh, but we need not consider it for, for, for today's purposes. Um, let me, however, say that the Kripke semantics with respect to which the paraconsistent logics Q and 4 and QC are complete is four valued. It allows for truth value gaps and gluts. Good. And I already said that this uh, connexive uh, first order logic is, uh, is a negation inconsistent. So it's negation inconsistent already in its propositional fragment. Uh, so uh, there is a 
ganzen äh, G3-Style um, Sequent Calculus for Quantified C. And here's a simple, um, uh, sim yeah, so two simple derivations showing that the logic is negation inconsistent. So uh, the first three steps just uh, um, are uh, con um, implication introductions on the right. But we start from uh, from this uh, axiomatic sequence, and here some uh, weakening is involved. Yes, we have a, a, a weakening built into the into the uh, um, um, initial or axiomatic sequence, and then here we apply the uh, rule for introducing the universal quantifier on the right, and here we apply the rule for uh, introducing negated universal uh, quantifier on the right, and then yeah, hey, we have a, a an example of a proof of contradiction. So uh, in yesterday's talk, uh, Andrew Tedder pointed out that this might well lead one to a very strong form of dialetheism. Yes, uh, but uh, it's one is not forced into a, a very strong form of meta of dialetheism as a metaphysical position. Uh, one could um, avoid this uh, entanglement uh, with uh, metaphysics by. Um, um, by, 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 by taking uh, an informational view, by um, looking at this through, through informational lenses. And then uh, this view would have it that uh, there are formulas, that there are formulas A such that every information state tells both A and, uh, and its negation true, that it tells A uh, a true and false. So this telling true um, um, metaphor, of course, reminds you of uh, Belknap's told true values instead of truth values. So uh, being true is different from being told true. And instead of uh, uh, talking about telling uh, statements or formulas true, you could also think of support of truth versus support of falsity. So and uh, it is obviously reasonable to draw a distinction between a state uh, supporting the truth of a formula A or a formula A being, being true at that state. And uh, such a view uh, I have called strong dimathematism. This is a tongue twister for some, but I think uh, if you practice long enough, it's, it's not so difficult to pronounce this. So, and there, there's a paper why I, where I present this, but maybe we need not go into this. So I can only uh, tell you that if you're interested in dimathematism or strong, even strong dimathematism, here's a, uh, a paper uh, where you can find this notion introduced. We are done with the preliminaries. Uh, we can move on to the drinker principle or drinker paradox and the drinker truism and, and, and their duels. So uh, in a paper from 1978, and actually this is a picture taken in 1978, uh, Ray Smalian uh, pr uh, presented various, um, as he called them, logical curiosities. And one is the curiosity he called the drinker principle, a principle that according to him at first sight seems downright crazy, but then turns out to be valid in classical logic, which, uh, yes, throws a certain light on classical logic. And Smalian explained uh, the name drinker principle by uh, remarking that in front of students, he usually uh, prefaced its study with the following story. Um, there's some dialect in the story. I'm, I'm not sure whether I can imitate the dialect, but anyway, here the story goes. A man was at a bar. He suddenly slammed down his uh, fist and said, Give me a drink and give everyone else a drink. Cause when I drink, everybody drinks. So drinks were happily passed around the house. Sometime later, the man said, give me another drink and give everyone else, else another drink. Cause when I take another drink, everyone takes another drink. So second drinks were happily passed around the house. Soon after, the man slammed some, uh, slammed some money on the counter and said, and when I pay, everybody pays. So what is the puzzling question here? Does there really exist someone such that if he drinks, everybody drinks? Okay, if you translate this into the language of first order logic, the question is whether this uh, formula, the drinker principle, is valid. And the fact that classical logic validates the drinker principle is uh, often referred to as the drinker paradox because it is uh, sort of strange that uh, this uh, formula should be valid. And Smullyan also mentions a no less at first sight, downright crazy dual version of the drinker principle, the dual, uh, dual drinker principle. 
And uh, it is paraphrased, the paraphrase as follows. There's someone such that if anybody at all drinks, then he does. So this, the next okay. such that there is, if there's someone who drinks, then X drinks. And interestingly, the, but this is just a side remark, the, the drinker dual principle, it is, can be found in a book by Everett uh, Bett, Bet, and there he calls it Plato's law. But he unfortunately does not give any justification for, why, uh, for calling the dual uh, drinker principle Plato's law. So since the DDP is valid in classical first order logic as well, the defender of classical logic not only faces a drinker paradox, but also a dual drinker paradox. Good. But we know that these uh, paradoxes can be avoided if we take the step from classical uh, to intuitionistic first order logic. Now, whereas the validity of the uh, drinker principle and its dual in classic logic is bewildering or maybe paradoxical, there are some plausible principles um, uh, which are invalid uh, in uh, classical logic, intuitionistic logic, and Nelson's logic and four. And I will call these principles the drinker truism and the dual drinker truism. So here's the drinker truism. Uh, I, maybe we can read it as follows. It's false that there's someone such that if she drinks, then for everybody it is false that they drink. Okay, so I, uh, I uh, quite um, deliberately use here this a bit the clumsy uh, uh, paraphrase because I mean if we are if we are looking at N four, then the negation should probably not be read it is it is not the case. It, it's the strong negation. It is, it expresses falsity. And the dual drinker uh, to, to drinker truism is this formula. It is false that there's someone such that if everybody drinks, it is false that she drinks. And we may note that uh, these uh, formulas, the drinker truism and its dual, are valid in quantified C. And not only are they valid, I think that their validity, the validity can be justified from the point of view of a certain proof-disproof interpretation of the logical operation that improves on the brauer height and Komogorov interpretation. And, uh, and uh, the, the soundness of intuitionistic logic with respect to the brauer height and Komogorov interpretation it is often seen as really uh, showing or, um, well, yes, showing that, that, that we are really uh, dealing with a constructive logic in the case of intuitionistic first order logic. Good. So now I come to the main part of the talk. Uh, I will discuss the constructiveness of classical logic, intuitionistic logic, N4 and C. Well, and classical logic is out uh, pretty much from the beginning because, uh, yes, and uncontroversial characteristics of constructiveness of a logic based on our language is the invalidity or unprovability uh, of the law of excluded middle. And of course, we have it in classical logic. So classical logic is out. And as I said, intuitionistic logic is often identified with constructive logic. Um, yes. In, and in intuitionistic logic, the, the problematic uh, uh, non-constructive uh, law, law of excluded middle, it is interderivable with double negation elimination. In N4, it is not. Uh, I will come back to this. Um, so this may then be seen um, as a problematic feature of first order intuitionistic logic if double negation elimination could be given a justification that makes it acceptable from a constructive point of view. And this is exactly what's going to happen in N4. So N4 is in a clear sense more constructive than intersynistic logic, but it, it, but it validates both De Morgan laws, uh, yes, both double negation, uh, both double negation laws and all the De Morgan laws. Okay. And there are two other uh, properties of first order intersynistic logic that have been put forward as indicating that uh, first order intuitionistic logic is indeed a system of constructive logic, namely the so-called disjunction property and the existence property. And they both fail in, in classical logic and uh, underlining uh, once again that classical logic is not is not constructive. So maybe probably you, you are familiar with this uh, with this uh, properties. So the disjunction property says that um, uh, actually if, if A or B is provable, then either A is provable or B is provable. Um, 
And the existing property says that, well, if you can prove there's an X, uh, A of X, then you need a witness. So when I teach this, to, uh, when, I, when I talk, when I present this to our students, I say, well, if you want to want to prove the existence of Marsians, it is not enough to arrive uh, to, to drive a contradiction from the assumption that there are no Marsians. You give me give me one one uh, one Marsian. Okay, good. So these properties are enjoyed by both intuitionistic first order logic and uh, uh, quantified N four. But David Nelson, he seems to uh, seems to have been the first to suggest that the disjunction property and the existence property ought are not enough; that they ought to be complemented by their duals, uh, namely the constructible falsity property and the dual of the existence property. And for first order Nelson's logic, these properties indeed hold. So, if the negation of A and B is provable, then not A is provable or B is provable, uh, and the, if the negation of for all x a x is provable, then the negation of a uh, with c for x, uh, c for x is provable for some constancy. Good. So this there's already a clear sense in which Nelson's first order logic is more constructive than intuitionistic first order logic because it satisfies not, it satisfies not only the dis, uh, disjunction and existence property but also the constructible falsity property and and the dual uh, existence property. Now, as I already said, the constructive understanding of the logical operations is usually explained in terms of the so-called brauer heitin kolmogorov interpretation of the logical operations. And what is this? It comes as a recursive definition of the notion pi is a proof of formula L. So in our case, uh, pi is a proof of L formula A. And I'm not sure whether all of you have seen the, 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 the BHK interpretation, so I will go through it, um, although probably many of you have seen it. So uh, we have atomic L formulas. So uh, the, the BHK interpretation says that for atomic sentences, we assume that we know intrinsically what a proof is. For example, pencil and paper calculation serves as a proof of 7 times 37 equals 999. This is the, the, the inductive base for the, for the definition. And then we have to look at the, at the shape of the, of, of the uh, compound formulas. So a proof of A and B is a pair pi 1, pi 2, an ordered pair, pi 1, pi 2, consisting of a proof pi 1 of A and a proof pi 2 of B. A proof of A or, uh, or B is also a pair, a pair I, an ordered pair I pi with um, uh, I equals 0 and pi is a proof of A or I equals 1 and pi is a proof of B. So a proof of uh, A or B essentially is a proof of A or a proof of B. The most interesting clause is the clause for the conditional. A proof of A implies B is a function which maps each proof pi of A to a proof f of pi of B. And then I think this is taken, I think, from uh, Trulstra and Van Dahl. They, they say, with respect to negation, in general, the negation not A is treated as A implies falsity, uh, or bottom, where falsity is a sentence with no possible proof. And then the proof of all xA is a function f, which maps each point A of the domain, each, uh, each individual of the domain, uh, to proof f of a of uh, a with lowercase a for x, and a proof of finally the proof for, uh, of uh, there's an x a is a is a pair uh, a pi where a is an uh, the point of the domain of definition, and pi is a proof of a with a for x. Okay, so uh, if there's something problematic with this uh, with this BHK. Uh, and, and interpretation of the logical operations from our language then it is uh, the clause for uh, negation, the treatment of negation as A implies absurdity or A, A implies falsity. Um, so Tools and Van Dalen already point out that the notion of absurdity is to be regarded as an unexplained primitive notion. They also remark that any mapping whatsoever may count as a proof of A uh, bottom implies A. And they also uh, point out that uh, Johansson uh, um, rejected uh, Bottom implies A as a con constructive principle, so X, uh, X falls or quadlibet. Nevertheless, according to Trulz and Van Dahl, the BHK clauses suffice to show that certain logical principles should be generally acceptable from a constructive point of view, while some other princi principles from classical logic are not. So they are what they call weak counterexamples. And here's an example. One example of a principle that is highly implausible given the BHK interpretation is the law of excluded middle. 
uh, the LEM cannot be strictly refuted on the basis of BHK interpretation, interpretation but uh, the BHK interpretation allows one to give a, give a weak counterexample. And then they reason as follows, a proof of A or not A for any A would amount to a universal method for obtaining either a proof of A or a proof of not A, while there's no reason to assume that such a method exists. Good. So this is the BHK interpretation. And uh, there's another slide on the BHK interpretation. <laughs> so according to Sam Bass, it is not difficult to see that the sequence calculus, uh, this should be LJ. Uh, LJ for intersynistic first order logic is sound under the BHK interpretation. And so far that any formula provable in it has a proof in the sense of the BHK interpretation. Um, given certain concerns about how negation is treated in the BHK interpretation, I will come to this in a moment. We, we restrict our attention here to uh, positive uh, first order intersynistic logic in the positive language. And then if we think of derivations from assumptions, if you consider not just proofs and, uh, or verifications, but uh, proofs from derivations from assumptions, a proof of A from premises A1 to IN, then is what? It's a function F such that if it is applied to proofs pi 1 to pi N of uh, the assumptions A1 to IN, one obtains a proof F of pi 1 to pi N of A. And then if such a function exists, the inference from A1 to IN to A is uh, viewed as constructively valid or acceptable. Oh yes, and a formula for which the VHK interpretation ensures the existence of a proof is seen as acceptable or justified. And then there's this uh, observation of soundness for positive intersynistic first order logic with respect to the VHK semantics or interpretation. So if A is derivable from A1 to AN, then there exists a function F such that for any proofs pi 1 uh, to pi n of a1 to a n, f of pi1 uh, to pi n is a proof of a. So when we can just uh, do a proof, uh, an inductive inductive proof. Good. So this was the BHK interpretation for positive intersynistic logic. Now we come back to, to negation. So the BHK interpretation can and has been criti criticized for its treatment of negation as implies absurdity. Uh, and here's a quote from uh, Edgar Lopez Escobar. He says, for example, if one accepts that there is no const construction that proves an absurdity, as do most people, then a salient property of the construction pi that proves not A is that when pi is applied to a particular non-existent non construction, namely proof of A, it is another non-existent construction. Um, okay, this is probably not the most benevolent reading of the BHK clause for uh, interest negation, but I think he has a point. So by the BHK clause for negation, a proof of the intersynistically valid not A and not A is a function F, which maps each proof of A and not A to a proof F of each proof pi of A and not A to a proof F of pi of bottom or falsity, which does not exist. Since A and not A has no proof, any function mapping or constructing whatsoever proves not A and not A. But this conception of any proof, uh, any construction whatsoever proving A not Proving the negation of A and not A, this conception may be criticized as being not especially constructive. And an early criticism along, along these lines can already be found in the work of Gris on neg negationless mathematics. So whether or not you are uh, convinced by this criticism of the BHK interpretation, um, there's an alternative to it, and it was proposed by, by Edgar Lopez Escobar. And he suggested to supplement the BHK interpretation of positive intersynistic logic, that's okay, with a primitive notion of refutation or disproof to give an interpretation for negation. And as a result, and upon disregarding bottom or falsity, one obtains a semantics for the four-valued part consistent constructive logic with strong negation and four. So uh, Lopez Escobar's idea of supplementing the notion of proof with the notion of disproof that are equally important and on a par, it uh, very straightforwardly leads you to uh, Nelson's four value logic. And he gives the following disproof interpretation of the intersynistic connectives and or if then and the quantifiers and then now the strong negation. Uh, and here it is. So he has to tell you what is the construction of a compound uh, uh, of a compound formula in, uh, 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 in the first place. So the construction, uh, the construction C, he says, refutes A and B if C is of the form ID with I either 
zero, zero or one. If i is zero, then g refutes a. If i is one, then g refutes b. So this is dual to what we've seen for the uh, for the clause for disjunction in the BHK interpretation for positive interest logic. The construction C refutes A or B if C is of the form is a pair D E and D refutes A and E refutes B. Yes. The construction C refutes A implies B if C is of the form D E and D proves A and E refutes uh, refutes B. So not A implies B is understood as A and not B. The construction C refutes for all X A if C is of the form is a pair A D and D refutes uh, A with A for X. The construction uh, C refutes uh, this and X A if C is a general method of construction such that given any individual, that is construction of the species under consideration, so this is a quote from Lopez Escobar, C A, that is C applied to A, uh, it refutes A uh, with A for X. And now the, the, we also have to say what it means to refute a negated formula. The construction C refutes not A if C proves A. So the strong negation is a kind of uh, device that toggles between proofs and refutations. And this is certainly a very natural, natural idea uh, to work with proofs and refutations as uh, two kinds of derivations that are on a par and, uh, they, that, that, inter and uh, that, that you can go back and forth by means of the strong negation. And we will assume that both uh, the proofs and disproofs of atomic sentences are atomic. Good. Okay. Yes, I will also read through this slide. Good. Whereas uh, the first five disproof clauses clearly specify the form of canonical refutations of conjunctions, disjunctions, implications, and quantified formulas, the clause for strong negation is sort of different. It st uh, specifies that the construction C is a refutation of not A, just in case the very same construction C is a proof of A. So we can, we can, uh, we, there, there, there's, there's no pairing or uh, 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 required, or there are no functions involved, no constructions involved. Moreover, Lopez Escobar requires that a construction C proves not A if C itself refutes A, and not if C is the proof of A implies absurdity, and so thus it has, therefore has a specific form. And he, he makes some, some fundamental assumptions, namely that for no formula A there exists a construction that both proves and disproves A. And we can then call the combination of the BHK interpretation for the positive interstitistic logic with the above uh, uh, disproof clauses added by Lopez Escobar, the Lopez Escobar um, interpretation. It is not connexive, not A implies B means A and not B. We can also observe that if we assume that for no formula A there exists both the proof of A and not A, then X contradictione quad libet um, becomes provable. And we have that uh, first order Nelson logic N4 is sound with respect to the Lopez Escobar interpretation. Good. <laughs> and now, of course, I want to proceed to the connexive Lopez Escobar interpretation, but this is only a very small step. We obtain it from the Lopez Escobar interpretation upon replacing the refutation clause for, uh, for uh, conditionals uh, by now requiring this. A refutation of A implies B is a function F again, but now um, a function F which maps each proof pi of A to a disproof F of pi of B. So not A implies B means uh, A implies not B. And then, yes, uh, first order C is sound with respect to the connexive Lopez Escobar interpretation. Good. Okay, now I want to claim that there is a sense in which uh, first order C is even a bit more constructive than first order N4, which is clearly more constructive than intrusionistic logic. And this is uh, what I want to come to now. So note that for any proof pi of a formula A, uh, note that any proof uh, pi of a formula A is also a proof of A or B, for any L formula B. According to the BHK interpretation, thus one and the same construction gives infinitely many syntactically, uh, proofs infinitely many syntactically different L formulas, because if, a, if the proof of A is also proof of A or B, it's also proof of A or B or C and so on. And following Lopez Escobar the connexive, uh, and the connexive proof-disproof interpretation, it may happen that two syntactically distinct formulas have identical proofs or identical disproofs. So any formulas A and not not A, for example, have both identical proofs and identical disproofs. That is, no proofs, respectively disproofs of A and not uh, not, not A are distinct. And in, in view of such a situation, I think one may find, may, may find the following property desirable, which I call proof-disproof parity. 
So uh, proof disproof parity is satisfied when for, whenever for every L formula A, the following equivalence holds. A has the same proofs as an L formula B, if and only if A, a and B have the same disproofs. So if they have the same proofs, this is holds just in case they also have the same disproofs. This is then important for me because the Lopez Escobar interpretation does not enjoy proof disproof parity. Here's a simple context sample. We can, it's, it's, it's very simple. We can go through it. So, um, suppose pi is a proof of not A implies B. Well, then the Lopez Escobar interpretation says us, uh, this is the case if and only if pi is a disproof of A implies B. If and only if pi is a pair, pi one, pi two, such that pi one is a proof of A and pi two a disproof of uh, B. If and only if pi is a pair, pi one, pi two, such that pi is a proof of A and pi two is a proof of not of the, of the strong negation of B, if and only if pi is a proof of A and not B. But now every disproof of not A implies B is a proof of A implies B. But a proof of A implies B is different from a disproof of A and not B. Because every disproof of A and not B is a proof of not A or B. And a proof of not A or B is different from a function which maps each proof pi of A to a proof uh, F of pi of B. So the, 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 the uh, Proof disproof parity does not hold for the Lopez Escobar interpretation, but uh, I want to set apart the um, first order N4 from first order C and the uh, Lopez Escobar interpretation from the connective Lopez Escobar interpretation. And then it's a very welcome observation to note that uh, proof disproof parity holds for literal. Uh, if, if proof disproof parity holds for literals, then it holds for the connective proof disproof interpretation. So if this is, 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 is this is a property that is has a has a constructive flavor, then uh, the um, con connexive uh, Lopez Escobar interpretation is a bit more constructive, and uh, C is a bit more constructive than than first uh, first order N four. You may wonder whether proof disproof parity as a property possessed by the connexive proof disproof interpretation implies the congruentiality of a logic with respect to which the connective proof disproof interpretation is sound, so that we have the replacement property, but this is not the case. So the two distinct formulas, PA implies PA and QA implies QA, they are mutually, mutually derivable in, in uh, quantified C, but their negations are not mutually derivable. derivable. So uh, we can have a proof disproof parity, but uh, we need not therefore have uh, congruentiality. Is uh, the connexive proof disproof interpretation the only proof disproof interpretation that enjoys proof disproof parity? No. Um, so um, this in Francis suggested um, a certain uh, thesis which he um, calls Boethius negation left thesis. Um, and we have them here. So if A implies B, then it's not the case uh, that not A implies B, and if not A implies B, then it's not the case that A implies B. So the, the, this, these are negation left thesis because, I mean, uh, in connexive logic, we would have if A implies B, then it's not the case that A implies not B, and here the negations on the left you know, at the antecedent. So it's, okay. And he, he has a story uh, to suggest the, these principles. Um, uh, the motivation uh, is in terms of in, in, uh, intonational stress patterns in English. Then he has a natural reduction proof system that lays down falsif uh, a falsification condition for conditionals that amounts to replacing our uh, connexive axiom with this one, not A implies B, if and only if not A implies B. And then, of course, we can uh, uh, adjust the uh, uh, Lopez Escobar proof disproof interpretation uh, and get this clause pi is a disproof of A implies B, if and only if pi is a function f, which maps each disproof pi of A to a proof. Uh, f of pi of b. Okay, we can then, for the time being, refer to this uh, interpretation as the negation left interpretation. And uh, if proof disproof parity holds for literals, the proof uh, disproof parity holds also for uh, Nissen uh, Frances's uh, negation left interpretation. However, there's a problem for it. Suppose we want to have the drinker truism and its dual as valid. So given the drinker truism and its dual, 
the negation left interpretation allows one to validate two highly irritating principles that would speak against uh, going for, for the um, negation left interpretation. Uh, and following a Smolian's drinker story, they may be called the non-drinker principle <laughs> and the dual non-drinker principle. So here it is. Uh, for every x not px implies for all y not py. Everybody's such that if it's false that she drinks, then for everyone it is false that they drink. And the dual and non-drinker principle is this one. Everybody is such that if for someone it is false that she drinks, then it is false that they drink. Uh, okay. This uh, can be uh, validated. And uh, so if the drinker truism and its dual are, want, are wanted, uh, we thus have an abstainer paradox and a dual abstainer paradox that speaks against the negation left interpretation. Good. How am I doing time-wise? Oh, oh, still 10 minutes. Good. Uh, okay. Here's a, a comment on a recent paper. There's a very remarkable, hitherto unpublished paper by David Fazio, Antonio Leda, and Francesco Paoli. And there they have shown that a connexive implication lives within intuitionistic logic. Uh, and uh, I will here introduce another symbol for it, uh, that it can be defined within intuitionistic logic by a simple definition. So uh, if A then B is defined as uh, if A then B and not A then, then not B. So here this arrow is the intuitionistic arrow and the tilde here is the implies uh, absurdity, a negation of intersynistic logic. And this shows that one can get a connexive implication with respect to the intersynistic implies falsity negation, which is certainly interesting. And then also a quantified intersynistic propositional, uh, yes, quantified intersynistic propositional logic is a constructive connexive logic. Uh, Okay, but since the constructible uh, falsity property and the dual of the existence property fail for intersynistic first order logic, the point remains that both uh, can be uh, Nelson's first order logic and C, first order C can be seen as being more constructive than IPR. And then quantified, maybe I should have, the yeah, quantified intersynistic, where's, oh, the P does not stand for propositional, but for uh, predicate logic, sorry. Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm not consistent with the, with the notation on, on this slide. I'm sorry for this. But the drinker truism and its dual fail to be valid if the constructive in, in, uh, implication is replaced by the defined connection one in QPR. So this, this observation does not, does not speak against the point I want to make in, the, in, in, in this paper. It's time to summarize. So let me emphasize again. The first order logics uh, of uh, Q and 4 and QC, they are more constructive than intuitionistic first order logic. Why? Because they enjoy certain established constructivity or constructiveness properties that we cannot find with intuitionistic first order logic. However, QC is unorthodox, not only because it is connexive and thus contraclassical, but also because it is negation inconsistent. So it's non-trivial, but uh, contradictory. Good. The step from Nelson's first order logic to, uh, uh, to QC gives one a logic that validates the drinker truism and the dual drinker truism. And that may be seen as wanted. And the, the step from Q and 4 to QC is motivated not only by the desire to have the drinker truism and the dual drinker truism, but also by observing that the connexive proof disproof interpretation en enjoys uh, proof disproof parity, which can be seen as a as a property with a constructive flavor under the assumption that proof disproof parity holds for literals. So here, the, the, this table summarizes what I've been presenting. If we look at first order intersynistic logic, it does not uh, uh, validate double negation elimination and this De Morgan law. We do not have full um, interde interdefinability or duality between uh, the uh, universal and the particular quantifier. But we have these in quantified N4, so there's no reason, or let me put it differently, there's a reason to consider double negation elimination as constructively okay. Uh, however, um, neither quantified intrusionistic logic nor quantified N4 uh, give you the drinker truism and its dual. We have it all here uh, for quantified C, and in addition to uh, 
To that, we also have proof disproof parity, which we do not have on the left-hand side. Okay, this slide is a bit repetitive here. Nevertheless, the QN4 validates double negation elimination in all the De Morgan laws. So from the point of view of QN4 and the Lopez escobar interpretation, these principles are constructively acceptable. And note that double negation elimination does not lead to the validity of the law of excluded middle uh, if it's added to Nelson's logic or C. It gives you only classical, it gives you classical logic if you add it to, um, uh, to uh, intrusionistic logic. Yes, QC is contra classical. Um, but if contra classicality is not in principle excluded by one's methodology, then it's conceivable that the BHK interpretation and the Lopez Escobar interpretation miss some constructively perfectly acceptable principles, which are not theorems of classical logic. According to the connective Lopez Escobar interpretation, the drinker truism and its dual are valid, which both are not theorems of classical logic. Their intuitive plausibility, together with proof disproof parity as a constructiveness feature, possessed by the connexive Lopez Escobar interpretation, can be seen to suggest that the contradictory logic QC is even more constructive than first order N4. And that's the end of my story. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Professor Heinrich, we're going to start with questions. Alejandro. Yeah, well, th thanks a lot for the for the talk. It was really stimulating. And uh, well, my my I have a curiosity that is how constructive you you would like to be because I I tend to be like a less strict con constructivist, let's let's say, because I was thinking about this uh, example by Domet uh, about uh, testing uh, if an, a complex number is prime or not. And uh, what? Uh, and uh, and then um, yeah, I was thinking about this this example of Domet, like a very strict constructivist will say that uh, if uh, x x prime or it is not prime, uh, that strict constructivist will say that that's true only if that uh, one decision or the other has been verified. Mm -hmm. But we have also this reading of a less um, a strict constructivist that will say, okay, I I will tell you that that's a conjunction is true already because we have an effective method to decide that, right? And I will say also, like, probably I will demand a bit more and not it's not enough that we have an, an effective method, but a, a tractable method. But yeah. uh, let me, but that's probably another discussion. And but I'm curious about that, right? Because, uh, well, okay, just to finish the point is like, I like, I do like bet semantics for intuitionistic mm -hmm. logic. So you know that bad semantics characterize this less strict yeah. uh, constructivism, and uh, Kripke semantics matches the the very strict constructivism, mm -hmm. and and you are getting even mm -hmm. uh, uh, more constructive, mm -hmm. right? And uh, yeah, well, this is I, I don't know if I can make my second. Uh, Maybe not because otherwise I might forget about. Okay. This. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for this question, and I, I can tell you that I'm not a dog, diehard dogmatic constructivist. So um, uh, this is visible in, for instance, a certain paper I've written together with Itoshi Omori, who is unfortunately not participating uh, this time. Uh, and there we introduce um, a system we call C3, uh, which is definitely less, less constructive than C because we there consider the LEM for, for atoms, as far as I remember. So um, yes, um, and also I'm very open to considering uh, bad semantics. Actually, we have a colleague in Bochum who's, who is uh, working on bad semantics, Satoru Niki, so. Um, yes, um, so as I said, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a diehard dogmatic constructivist. I just wanted to compare four systems. And um, I think the, the division between classical and both intuitionistic and Nelson logic is clear. Classical logic is not constructive. Intuitionistic logic is seen by many as constructive, uh, the, the constructive logic. I think it's fair to say that Nelson improves on this. And then I think there's a, maybe a, a little tiny bit more of, uh, of constructiveness uh, if, if you go to first order C, 
And in, in, as an additional benefit, you have uh, the drinker tourism and it's dual. Okay. Second one. Okay, oh. really quick. Yeah, yeah well, it's super quick. It's just, I wonder if you have um, the calculi for this, you present the Hilbert style calculi, but I wonder if you have a tableau label, sign tableau, because I mean, I know that yeah. we will be like uh, almost copying the pet semantics, the crypt semantics. Yeah. Or this bidimensional approach to consequence, right? Uh, and uh, it could be done. Yes, true. I think that there's um, um, writing, uh, uh, formulating the tableau systems is rather straightforward, I would say. Um, so the, 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 this is not a big technical challenge. And uh, we have, uh, there, there are some bilateral proof systems uh, for, for C and also for, for fragments and also for for all um uh for 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 var variations on um on fde where you keep the the the, the truth conditions in the um, relational dumb semantics for for negation but consider all the var var variations of the falsity conditions so and, and but also for c there there's this um sub formula there's, there's a sub formula uh, uh, sequent calculus where you have two sequent arrows, one one representing proofs, the other falsification uh, 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 refutation. So there, 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 there's quite a bit of structural proof theory already for, for all these logics. Yeah. Okay, so we're having a question from Andy Kapster at Zoom, and then we follow up with Wolfgang. Okay, so Andy, you can go on. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, a great talk. Thank you very much. That was. Uh, Really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the paper in, in detail and thinking through uh, these things in, in um, more detail. But um, I, I just want to say two impressions. Um, one is that that this parity condition, uh, that, that seems very plausible to me. Um, and that this is, um, yeah, I, I think I like that, um, just, to <laughs> just to say that. The, the, the other way, um, I, one can feel about things is about this, uh, this, um, uh, the slide where you said, well, classical logic obviously isn't constructive because it uh, validates a uh, lot of excluded middle. Um, and, and, uh, you know, that I, I wrote a book about logics that I claim are constructive, but oh, validate, uh, yeah. LEM. And, and the obvious answer to that is who cares what, what I write in my books. But as you just brought up C3, I think, I think I remember you saying something very similar about C3 in your paper with Hitoshi. Oh. And of course, uh, that's maybe the nature of uh, co-authored papers that um, maybe that's yeah. what you wrote. But, um, but I, I do remember you saying, well, even though LEM is satisfied here, we, we clearly have... Um, Connexive, um, uh, okay. uh, constructive, yeah. um, constru constructive features here, and we can talk about yeah. this as a constraint, which I believe is true. Um, yeah. I, I think this is down to how we interpret yeah. the semantics. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, of course, it's not always um, easy to be consistent in everything one is writing, but I think I've, I've, I'm, 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 yes, I, I'm, I've not gone inconsistent. So, I mean, in, in the paper, yes, we, I, I, would, I would be definitely uh, ready to to concede that C, C3 has a very strong con constructive constructive properties. Yes, but um, but nevertheless, general, generally, uh, why why do people reject classical logic as, as non-constructive? Uh, if you ask them, they normally would point to the to the logic in the middle. So that's just what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you, Andy. We're following up with Wolfgang. Okay, um, first of all, thank you for your talk, which showed me once again that there are so many non-classical logics, and you know so much about classic non-classical logic, which I have never heard about before. So I'm wondering, however, how much we need of all these uh, uh, zoo of non-classical logics in particular. I want to, don't want to discuss this mm -hmm. in detail, but I wonder today whether we need any non-classical logic in order to solve this uh, interesting uh, thing which you presented as uh, uh, something derived from Smalian's uh, stories. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Smalian is an excellent uh, yeah. magician and he knows interesting stories. And again, the story itself 
was interesting and funny, but actually I failed to see the paradox in it, which you later on reconstructed as a formula, yeah. which you say is provable or valid in yeah. classical logic. Yeah. But this formula uh, uses an arrow. Mm -hmm. And this arrow, well, of course, uh, should re uh, correspond to the if then of the of the drinker who says if I drink uh, I have a drink then everybody else in, in this room will get a drink and so on if then but your your arrow uh, as far as I could got, got it from from the introduction of all, all these systems is material implication no it's not but you have this action you mentioned action a seventeen which clearly shows that arrow is material implication. A17. If the negation of an arrow is A and non B, then... Uh... No, 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 no. So, we, uh, so in this Nelson logic, we take positive, positive intersonistic logic. So the, the, the truth conditions for the conditional are not the, 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 the conditions that the, you, you have in classical logic. So uh, in the semantics for N4, uh, there's a Kripke semantics, and it, it has two two clauses in the in the semantics. So the, the support of truth and the support of falsity conditions, and the support of truth conditions for this uh, for this conditional uh, are the one for, ones from intuitionistic logic. So uh, we do not have Pers we do not have Peirce's law. So if uh, so in in, in classical uh, implicational logic. You have uh, you have this formula called Peirce's law. It, it is really distinctive of uh, classical intuitionistic logic. You do not have it here. So this is not we do not have Peirce's law in, uh, in Nelson's logic. It is not the material conditional. Uh, the the falsity condition, yes, it looks pretty classical. Not A implies B means A and not B, but the truth conditions they are intuitionistic. Well, <laughs> yeah. so the point is that uh, the, the tilde is not a classical negation. The tilde here is with a strong negation, as, as it is called, yes. Uh, whatever that means, I mean... Oh, it, okay. it, mean, it means what we have seen in the, in the uh, uh, Lopez-Escobar interpretation. Okay, which, which I don't know anything of. So I, I was starting from, from this formula, I yeah. thought your arrow in the, in the representation of this uh, Smalian story would be... In, uh, Material implication, no. which is not so, uh, in a way, uh, this has been answered. But um, anyway, uh, uh, I thought, well, once again, if you have a look at the formula which you use to represent the so-called drinker's paradox. Yes. This one, DP. Okay. Then again, uh, I thought your, your strategy of arguing was this is provable in classical logic, yes. and, and in classical logic, of course, uh, the, the, the arrow is material implication. Yes, right. But, but then we have material implication after all. So no, material we have... implication represents what in the story of Marian is expressed informally by if then. I mean, of course, we have material implication in classical logic. Yes. So, yeah, so but uh, this this formula uh, is not, in my opinion, but not not at first sight paradoxical at, at all. Yeah. I see a certain similarity to the point we had uh, in the talk before by by Andy. Mm -hmm. He presents a formula, this function of two this, uh, of two implications, and doesn't explain exactly what the implication means. Mm -hmm. If the implication is material implication. The character of a paradox uh, yeah. vanishes, and okay. similarly here, if you spell the uh, arrow out as a material implication, perhaps this is no uh, um, paradox any in any serious sense at all. Okay, yeah, thank you for that question. So I actually have been rather cautious here. I said uh, the fact that classical logic validates the drinker uh, uh, principle is often referred to as the drinker paradox. So. Um, I mean, and also the term paradox is, of course, used differently. I mean, sometimes you use it, you really uh, reserve the term paradox for antinomies, for, for, for very, very really uh, um, 
derive a contradiction. M oftentimes, it is used in a much, a much more liberal sense. So the nobility, okay, in the nobility part, so you, you indeed do derive a contradiction. But anyway, some people talk about paradoxes if there's no 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 proof of a contradiction. And uh, but here I was a bit I was cautious as it's uh, the, the drinker principle. And of course, if you look at natural language, yes, then there is some talk about if then, and this well, yeah, what? How could you translate this? And I, I, I also emphasize that I use the same language for all the four quite different systems. So, um, and uh, what I just wanted to highlight here is that if if you interpret this this arrow as the classical uh, classical implication, and uh, then yes, you in classical logic you end up with the Drinker principle. And if you find that peculiar, I mean. Uh, Smaldin uses, uses um, if, you, if you use that language to translate ordinary language discourse, then, uh, well, Smaldin was led to, to rather strong language, downright crazy, he says. Okay. Um, so if, if you want to translate from natural language into the language of first order logic, and uh, then if you translate, um, if, 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 if you uh, read this in, in the um, way that uh, there is someone such that if he drinks, everybody drinks, then you better do not interpret this formula. Um, so if, if, you, if you want to avo avoid the translation of that natural language sentence as valid, then you better do not interpret uh, the, the, the error as a classical one. But moving to intercidistic logic already suffices to get rid of this. Okay, thank you. We still have about 20 minutes or 15 minutes for discussion. Yes, Damien. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik, for the talk. I, I really I really enjoyed it. And, and I was uh, very intrigued by the sort of progression that you mentioned in this chart at the end, where logics get uh, increasingly constructive. And yeah, in, in the end, you mentioned that, um, if I remember correctly, C has the proof disparity proof, uh, sorry, the proof, yeah. this proof parity, if literals have it. Yes. And so I was intrigued by uh, knowing whether there is a way of imposing the proof, this proof uh -huh. uh, parity for literals, like axiomatically or by rules or some, some, some way else. And then if there is, or if it appears to you that there is a justification for imposing or for requiring that parity for literals? Mm, that's a good question. Um, so at, at this point, I, 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 I'm afraid I do not have a good answer. So um, um, what, what, what I noticed is that if I assume it for literals, then I have it for the rest. And, uh, and this, at, at this point, it was enough for me to set uh, C apart from from these other two guys, um, I would have to think more about uh, proof just proof parity for, for, for atomic formulas and negative atomic formulas. Um, I would hesitate to give you an answer now. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Lewis, and we can go with both of you again. Yes, thank you. It, it is only because you mentioned you mentioned Nisim. So, um, in a sense, you started with the Lopez Escobar uh, proof disproof interpretation, and then you modified the disproof uh, condition for the conditional, yeah. yeah, or or the condition for the negated conditional. Yeah. And then you briefly considered the uh, Nissim versions of this connexive like schemas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the question is, uh, con considering the notions of proof and disproof, would it make sense to you to modify the proof disproof conditions for other connectives or it works only for the condition? No, I mean, once you start, uh tweaking falsity conditions. Yes, I mean, uh, this, um, I mean, you, you know that, that you need not stop with the, uh, at the conditional. You can, you, you coined this term Bochum plan, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, and then of course, yes, it would, 
uh, have repercussions to to uh, to, uh, to this to to variations of uh, the BHK interpretation. Yes. Yeah. Why not? Okay, so we go again with welfare. Only a very short and uh, simple question concerning the understanding of, of this interesting approach, which you uh, explained us in, in your bonus section, uh, concerning the possibility of uh, defining a connective ah. implication in terms of intuitionistic negation. If we can go to that slide. So I'm just wondering, uh, the, the left-hand side is you have a uh, subscript C to signalize that it is, it is to be defined connexive implication. But what is the meaning of the other two implication on the right-hand side? Are yeah. this material or, no, or no, strict no, no. implications? I, I, I think I said it, maybe I should have said it more, more uh, emphatically. This is interstitistic negation, uh, interstitistic uh, if then, and this is interstitistic negation. Uh, what what again is the arrow? The arrow is the um, intuitionistic if then the intuitionistic conditional. So you, you which is di really differs from from material implication. Yes. So here on the right hand Always, side, or? on the right hand side, you have the language of intuitionistic logic, and you introduce a new symbol, a, a, a new uh, connective. And therefore, I used a, a, a subscript to set it, to clearly set it apart. So, within the language of intuitionistic logic, you can define a two-place connective yes. that has that satisfies that's, the problem. That's clear, but uh, I'm surprised really to hear that, for instance, in the Heiting calculus, his implication operator is something else than classical uh, material implication. Yes, it is, of course. It is. Yes, of course, in 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 in, in, in logic, you do not have Peirce's law. Yes. The, 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 okay. the, the, the implication Again, of, so the implicational fragment of classical and intuitionistic logic are different. Okay, yeah. thank you for this information. Yes, Daniel. No, I mean it. Um, so this is a, just an observation, uh, just to to know where you empathize with this. Now that I see what you put there, I, I wasn't able to read their paper. Um, it seems rather obvious because okay. it, it appears to me that it embodies what you, what some of you folks in, in Bochum have been, you know, um, pushing with this idea of preserving, um, yeah, proofs and also preserving these proofs. And that's ex so, sort of exactly what it's doing, that if you go this way, so if you preserve truth from A to B, although intuitionistic logic does not exactly say that, but bear with me. And you also preserve falsity from, you know, yeah. antecedent to consequent, yeah. then you end up with something constructive, which is some, which something connective, which is more or less what I, I recall that you have been, you know, uh, arguing for yeah. all of you collectively. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. but I, I agree. Uh, I am a philosopher after all, and they have great expo uh, expository yeah. skills. But the paper is heavily <laughs> algebraic, so it's a difficult reading for me. Yeah. Are there any other comments or questions? I have a small question about that slide, if oh, I yeah. may. Um, wouldn't that definition uh, make the connexive implication uh, somewhat like a biconditional, somewhat as? A symmetric uh, conditional. Yeah, well, we, we do not have the contraposition here. This oh, is yeah. this is dangerous. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I mean, from the right, it looks like uh, yeah. a biconditional, but yeah, no. Okay, are there more comments? Yes, uh, Andy, you may go on if you like. Well, well, just on that, uh, just just from from remembering their 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 paper, it's it, but it is almost a biconditional, right? It is has it has un, unpleasantly biconditional uh, um, features. Uh, um, yeah, I think I think if A implies B, then uh, double negation of B implies not double negation of A or something like that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I don't don't have it really yeah. on my mind, but but. 
that was my reaction at the when they gave the talk as well. Um, that this might be problematic if you. It's not to the letter by conditional, but you know, it's almost, it's, you know, okay. Yeah. Th this reminds me and others probably of uh, Johansson's minimal logic. Uh, it it is a power consistent logic, but well, it's not not exactly in the spirit of power consistency. Okay. Anyone else? Well, so let's thank Henrik.